they play like dogs, hunt like wolves, and look more like sea lions than otters. And one woman has devoted her life to helping them. Diane McTurk faces a challenge to discover the fate of one of the rare giant otter orphans she has cared for. She rounds up all the help she can get, for Diane never gives up without a fight. One woman, one passion, one mission. Diane McTurk, a fifth-generation Guyanese, always gets her hands dirty, even though she's now in her 70s. Diane has managed the Karanambu Holdings on behalf of her family for over 20 years. The ranch extends over 125 square miles, equivalent to 275 square kilometers. Over the years, Karanambu, Diane's sanctuary and ranch, has been home to 36 rare giant otter cubs. Once a drama student, Diane now plays the part of a conservationist and caregiver. Well, it started as a totally emotional thing in the great pleasure that I took in receiving um, an otter as a gift at Christmas time, aptly named Frankincense, as I considered him a kingly gift. And I discovered that these animals are absolutely enchanting, intelligent, responsive, and extremely rewarding, both emotionally and eventually from the point of view of returning them to their wild environment. Diane loved the company of her new companions. I feel that I have an affinity for them. They are highly intelligent, very beautiful, and responsive animals. She discovered that her father's farm lies in what was once the heart of giant otter territory. Guyana is one of South America's smallest countries, 215,000 square kilometers, similar in size to the United Kingdom. The banks of the Rupununi River are home to a natural treasure, the biggest of the world's 13 otter species. Giant river otters were once widespread in South America. Their numbers have been decimated by the most dangerous creature in the world. Not caimans, but humans. Natural predators pose a constant threat to individual giant otters, but hunting and habitat destruction have decimated entire populations. In the 1970s, they came close to extinction. They are powerless to save their environment, but they put up a good fight against immediate dangers, like the black caiman. They do this by working like wolves, as a pack. The otters screech warnings to each other, bobbing their necks up like periscopes to monitor the caiman's movements. Scolding may also tell the caiman that its cover has been blown. Giant river otters live in extended families of up to ten, led by a permanently bonded alpha pair. They work together, hunting, defending their territory, and sharing the babysitting. They rely on each other, but if they become separated from their families, they need help. And that's where Karanambu comes in. Local people occasionally hunt otters for their fur and meat. Some cubs end up as pets, but they soon become unmanageable. The lucky ones are brought to Diane's orphanage. Diane treasures fond memories of all 36 of her charges, but one little orphan in particular stole her heart, Reva. 
she nursed him back to health and helped him learn how to fish like an otter and swim like a fish. Every day for 23 months, Diane cared for Reva. Then one day last year, he slipped off into the river and never came back. She hasn't seen him since. Diane has become extremely concerned about Reva's welfare. Did she equip him with all the skills he needed to survive? Is he still alive? Blue Ashley Holland has known Diane since he was a child and helps out at Karanambu. With his knowledge of the local rainforest and Diane's experience of otter behavior, they work out roughly where Reva might be. They'll begin by searching the lagoons nearest to Karanambu. But Diane is well aware that Reva could have settled much farther afield. Mm -hmm. Yes, the creek's But Reva is alive. Since he left Diane two months ago, he has struggled to cope in this strange new world. A wild otter his age should still enjoy the protection and companionship of a safe family group. Wild otters live in packs, protecting each other. Reva is alone, and therefore extremely vulnerable, and an easy target. He manages to feed himself, just like he learned to at Karanambu. But Diane never brought a caiman into the classroom. Reva lost his supper, but at least he didn't lose his life. It's a terrifying reminder that he probably won't survive out here on his own. Reva needs to find an adoptive family. The sooner the better. He needs to start looking for wild giant otters. Diane and Ashley head along the river in search of Reva, keeping a lookout for telltale splashes. In the dry season, Giant otters defend territories that can stretch as far as 10 kilometers along the river. But at this time of year, the rainy season, they roam even further afield. Apart from black caiman and a few birds, they don't spot much wildlife on the river. But the lack of apparent animal activity belies the true biodiversity in the forest that lies beyond. Acrobatic monkeys, brightly colored birds, and curious mammals like the tamandua are just some of the creatures native to Guyana. Diane knows she's unlikely to see some of these creatures on this stretch of the river, but she certainly knows where to find them. In 1983, Diane set up a tourist lodge to support her otter work. She firmly believes that it's never too late to make a difference. And so, at the age of 55, encouraged by eco-tourists, she took up a brand new interest. The one great pleasure that the hospitality industry brought me was bird watching. Before I actually became interested in the variety of birds, that we have around. They were so natural to have them around that I never actually paid a particular interest. It was just part of the scenery. And now I found the great pleasure in um, observing them, the tremendous excitement in seeing a new one, and also the pleasure of sharing my enjoyment with other people. For it's never boring, it's marvelous. The more Diane learns about the rainforest on her doorstep, the more she feels at home here, at one with her environment. 
Although they don't occur on this stretch of the river, Diane knows that somewhere out there, beyond the ranch and deep in the forest, elusive three-toed sloths go about their unusual lives. Although sloths can swim, this one sensibly heads for the riverbank. It must find a branch strong enough to hold its weight. It can't afford to make a mistake. much faster than it climbs, but a hungry black caiman can easily outstrip it. Fortunately, many animals do survive the floods. Downstream, another evicted sloth heads for higher ground to begin a new life in trees away from the perilous floodwaters. The search for Eva will have to wait. Back at the farm, her two current charges need her attention. And that means a daily swim. Brother and sister, Sergei and Sappho, know the routine. Now three months old, they ended up at Karanambu several weeks ago, after a local family decided they couldn't keep them as pets anymore. Diane's ultimate aim is for Sergei and Sappho to return to the wild. Before that happens, they must learn how to fend for themselves. In particular, how to catch fish. At the river, even their foster mother has trouble telling them apart. When you just see them swimming, it's impossible to tell which one is which because their heads are more or less the same shape and size. You have to wait for them to raise their heads. And then you see that each has a distinctive throat pattern. These two, Sappho has a very white throat, and um, Sergei has a lot of brown on his throat. And if you want them all, eat Sappho's head. The throat patches probably act like a kind of long distance name badge, enabling giant otters to identify each other, even from some distance. In the wild, the orphans will use their powerful jaws to crush live fish. For now, though, dead ones provide enough of a challenge. With its rows of razor-sharp teeth, a live piranha will readily bite back. Sappho is a, here is a perfect example of how an otter is not supposed to eat his fish, um, uh, or her fish in this case. Sergei is eating his correctly. They're supposed to eat, the, eat them head first because normally they would be catching that fish and um, it would be alive. And so therefore they have to kill it first, which means that they've got to get the head then. And then after that, they can start eating it. If that were a live piranha, Sappho could have her little webbed feet bitten to smithereens by now. Diane can help the otters learn some skills, but there are others that she cannot prepare them for, such as how to avoid caiman. Second greatest threat would be a caiman snapping up the uh, straggler in any family, you know, coming behind the weakest one. But she knows that Reva faces an even greater threat. I would say, actually, at this stage, that it's going to be other otters, wild otters passing, discovering that they have somebody else in their territory and actually killing them. We have had three young otters killed swimming from the sandbank here. We found one little body. It had been crushed straight through the skull. I mean, you know, you could see the, the marks of the canines meeting through their little skulls because we found another one the next morning. Such distressing memories only increase Diane's anxiety about Reva. 
Reaver, though, knows to keep his distance as he enters a stretch of river that's already occupied. He can't tell whether this family of giant otters would welcome him or reject him. He keeps his distance and retreats to the other side of the river to fish. The otters in a group hunt as a pack in deeper waters, but Reaver will have more chance of success if he sticks to the shallows. When he dives, small flaps of skin cover his nose and ears, forming a tight, waterproof seal. Water never touches his skin either, because short, dense guard hairs cover his entire body, keeping him dry and warm, like a set of waterproofs. Long whiskers sprout all over his muzzle, eyebrows and throat. Each one is loaded with nerve endings, so that even in murky water, he can feel his way around, sensing every pebble and ripple. He has perfected his fishing skills now and munches his way through about four kilos of fish a day. But something is missing. Companionship. Reva is lonely. He watches the otters on the other side of the river. They take a break from hunting and cuddle up together. Giant otters love physical contact and they spend a good deal of time grooming each other with their tiny incisors. After a swim, Reva needs to squeeze the water from his coat. But there's no one to rub his back. No friends to help him make sense of the big, wide world. The jungle feels so alien compared to the safe place where he spent his early weeks. Diane's farm, with its little treats and luxuries. Like the indoor swimming pool, for example. Sappho and Sergei need about four milk feeds a day. They guzzle their way through many litres of formula a week, until the age of about four months, when their mother would normally wean them. That time may not be too far off for the twins. Diane wants to make sure the transition from milk to solids happens smoothly. <coughs> she knows how precious Sergei and Sappho are, not just to her, but to the world. Giant otters are closer to extinction than any other large South American animal. The twins will soon join a wild population of no more than 5,000, perhaps only 1,000. Every cub that Diane can return to the wild makes a difference. But before they try to save their species, the cubs need to nap. And old oil drums make great cots. While they rest, Diane returns to the farm. It needs constant maintenance, and there's always something going wrong. The latest disaster involves tiny jaws with a huge appetite. Every so often, termites invade and cause havoc. This time, they've chewed the wooden posts and built mud nests at the top of the pylons. But Diane spots the pest control squad. Look, a tomandua. This is the... Uh, forest version of the uh, giant anteater. He eats arboreal termites and um, he has this marvelous prehensile tail. A tamandua can eat about 9,000 termites a day, searching them out with a sticky tongue that is some 40 centimeters long, longer in fact than its own head. 
Its prehensile tail helps grip the branches. The tamandua sometimes uses its tail as a prop, helping it to rear up on its back legs. Diane can only hope that the tamandua will stick around for a while and help keep the troublesome termites in check. Other wild visitors are not so welcome. In relation to the cattle industry, obviously I'm not too keen to see the, the big predators. The jaguar is a loss-making enterprise as regards the cattle and the horses, particularly the horses, because we've been having a steady drain through jaguars taking horses. And of course, actually, I would love to see a jaguar. I would be very happy if the jaguars would live all over the place, but just not eat the cattle <laughs> or the horses. <laughs> jaguars also hunt smaller animals, including otters. Reva needs to keep an eye on the bank, or he could get into serious trouble. Jaguars are already in trouble, as there are only 15,000 left. As well as attacks from jaguars, the cattle ranch also faces disease, a poor export market, and continuous rustling. Life is tough not just for Diane, but also for the Amerindian communities who live on the farm. When things go wrong, Diane refuses to feel defeated. Instead, she mucks in and does what she can to help. This sprightly 74-year-old thinks nothing of trekking alone through the bush to fetch water. She watches her step to avoid poisonous snakes, scorpions and spiders. But today's first wildlife encounter proves a pleasant surprise. She crosses paths with a harmless neighbour, a giant anteater. It can grow more than two metres long, from nose tip to tail tip. But giant anteaters aren't very social. They prefer to be alone. Once it's put some distance between them, the anteater resumes its task, licking up some 30,000 termites a day. Diane heads for the creek and finds it occupied by an anaconda. Typically, Diane is more concerned about the snake's welfare than her own. This is very unusual, actually, to find one in a drying up pond like this. It looks as though it's been hurt. It has a wound on its head. The wound may be the result of a struggle with prey, for anacondas are the biggest snakes in the world and can grow to 10 meters. They swallow deer, pigs, and even small caiman whole. Guyana means land of many waters because of its rich diversity of plants and animals. Through her work with giant otters at Karanambu, Diane has contributed a huge amount to protecting Guyana's natural legacy. But there's little hard cash to spare, and the ranch runs at a loss. Diane can rarely afford to buy new equipment or vehicles. Once again, it's a matter of mend and make do. To help protect giant otters, Diane set up the Otter Trust in 1996, with a mission much broader than just caring for orphaned otters. This was what gave me the idea of the trust, which was to be aimed at preserving wildlife, conserving the environment, and also at finding alternative means of livelihood for the Amerindian peoples of this area. We lose a few animals a year to jaguars, but it's mostly human predation. We have a lot of rustling across the border to Brazil, increasing as the population of the neighboring state of Roraima increases. As well as external threats, the cattle also battle against internal enemies that could kill them and ruin the farm.
Paranambu Ranch in tropical Guyana sits at the junction between savanna, swamp, and flood forest, a parasite paradise. Diane supervises the regular cattle health checks, but the cattle don't relish the idea of being caught, even if it is for their own good. Okay. The cattle are fine, but Diane still hasn't managed to check up on another creature, Reva, the otter orphan. In the dry season, the floodwaters recede, drawing the rainforest animals back down to the Rupununi River with them. Reva has probably lived alone since the day he left Diane, looking for his own territory far from the ranch. Unusually, there are three toed sloths here on the riverbank. Reva doesn't seem to mind. The sloths usually prefer to hang out deep in the forest. In between meals and naps, Reaver does his best to entertain himself. If there are no other otters to play with, a stick will have to do. But he never stops monitoring the activity on the other side of the river. A family of giant otters lives in a den dug deep into the sandy bank. Reva watches carefully as they scent mark the entrance with a thick, dark brown musky liquid from anal glands. This main campsite and breeding den lie within the core part of their home range, and they will defend their neighborhood against all other otters. And yet, they haven't shown any aggression to Reva. Wild otters will accept an outsider on one occasion only, if they've lost their alpha male or female. Is that why they're tolerating Reva's presence? If so, he might just stand a chance of being accepted. Diane always tries to find out how her otters get on once they return to the wild. Of the 36 otters that she has cared for over the years, at least 15 have survived in the wild, and two have bred. But Reva has eluded her for more than a year now. She didn't have any luck at the lagoons near the ranch, so it's time to head further downstream. Diane and Ashley search the smaller tributaries for traces of giant otters. This is perfect giant otter territory. Giant otters like slow-moving creeks, lakes, swamps and marshes, with low banks, a lot of cover, and shallow water with plenty of fish. Diane insists that they push on as far as possible. Eventually, though, they can go no further. Well, I'm prepared to concede that this might be a little difficult. Will Diane ever see Reva again? Or will she have to make do with her memories of his early days at Karanambu? Diane and Ashley abandon the search and head back to the river. 
unaware that just a few kilometers further away, Reva is alive and well and planning a search of his own. Reva turns detective. As soon as the wild otters have all left the den to go fishing for the morning, Reva goes snooping. Giant otters can detect scent from more than 100 meters away. Close up, Reva gathers detailed information about the sex, status and condition of each individual. He can find no trace of an alpha male. Disappointed by their failure to find Reva, Diane decides to spend a bit of time at a nearby lagoon. Accompanied by her assistant Kenneth, Diane heads for her favorite beauty spot to take a break and do some bird watching. This is a coolie pond, a mile or so upriver from Carinambo. You can probably see the line of uh, water on the trees over there. The water rises about 15 to 20 feet in this area. Because the fishing is good, this is a place where we frequently find the, the giant otters coming here to fish in the mornings particularly. Further downstream, Reva follows the otters as they set out in search of breakfast. This group of five is led by an alpha female who, like all alpha females, regulates the group's hunting, sleeping and resting. Apart from that, there's no hierarchy in giant otter society. Giant otters will drag a big catch onto the bank to eat, but if the prey is small enough, they will eat it in the water, holding it tight between their paws. When the alpha female surfaces with a fish, Reva notices something else too. Her pups quickly join her, hoping for some tasty morsels, but the female refuses to share. She must be trying to wean them. Back at Karanambu, Sappho guzzles her milk as fast as ever. Come, Sylvia, come. Milk, milk, milk. Milk, 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 my babe. But Sergei has begun to refuse his milk. If anyone can persuade him to feed, Diane can. Come, milk, milk, milk. Come, milk, my heart. Come, milk. Come. Come, my milk, baby. Yes, look at that. Come, let's have milk. Come, let's have milk, baby. Come, let's have milk, baby. Come, milk, darling. No, he does not look as though he wants his milk anymore. He's too big. And this has happened in the last two days. Come, oh. Diane knows what Sergei's behavior means. She's okay. seen it many times before. He's probably ready for weaning. Just like a wild otter would, Sergei will eventually switch from milk to solid food. Sergei needs Diane more than ever now to oversee the weaning process. But she's still anxious to find Reva, and so sends Ashley to look for him on his own. Ashley sets off the very next evening, and this time he'll be gone for a few days, because Diane wants him to search the lagoons far away from the farm. Ashley came to Guyana with his mother, who was a close friend of Diane's. He's grown up on this river. The idea of being alone in the jungle overnight doesn't bother him at all. Sergei wakes up hungry. Now that he's refusing milk, he needs more fish. 
which Diane buys from local fishermen every morning. Royal, well, thank goodness. The otters are starving. OK, I'm going to get two fish for you. <laughs> Do a swap? <laughs> The otters practice handling fish in the water during their twice daily swims. Diane pays local youngsters to swim and play with the cubs. Their boisterous games will help Sappho and Sergei become agile and quick in the water, essential hunting skills in the wild. The children know to keep their fingers well away from the otter's sharp teeth. Sappho, 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 Sappho. She's coming. Come, Sappho, Sappho, Sappho. The Otter Trust also aims to involve local people in conservation and provide an alternative form of income. The children benefit as well as the otters. All right, go back and go Oh, disaster, but whose clothes are those that are getting wet? Roach, your clothes are getting wet. <laughs> come, come, come in. Come, leave the people's clothes. Diane feels that it's crucial to involve local people because the future of the giant otter depends on their support. Reaver's future depends on his next move. The time has come to make contact with the otter family. And they answer back. They sound friendly enough. But if he misinterprets their meaning, Reaver could end up in a fight. He tries to make sense of the squeaks, hums, coos and whines. <coughs> Ashley, meanwhile, has made good progress. After a night on the shore, he makes an early start to travel beyond the last spot where he and Diane last searched for Reva. He encounters plenty of familiar wildlife. And even glimpses a wild giant otter. But it's not one of Diane's orphans. And there's still no sign of Reva. As Ashley pushes on deeper into the jungle, fresh tracks in the mud confirm that giant otters do live around here. Ashley knows how to blend in with the environment. He walks so quietly that a young tapir has no idea of his presence. He sticks to the tree line so as not to startle the wildlife. Not that the tapir would notice him now anyway. It's too preoccupied with its early morning bath. A relative of the rhino, the tapir uses its long, fleshy nose to sniff out plants, leaves, fruits and buds. Tapirs act as the rainforest's gardeners, spreading tremendous numbers of seeds in their droppings as they roam through the undergrowth. A little further downriver, Ashley spots the clearest sign yet that an otter group still occupies this territory, a den. The entrance is clear of debris. The mud looks damp and has fresh scratch marks etched into it. Giant otters use this den. Ashley has no doubt about that. A giant otter den extends some three meters into the ground so that the whole family can sleep inside. Giant otters also build a latrine area behind the den and flatten a campsite area nearby to use in the day. Wild otters can attack intruders, especially in the dry season when resources become scarce. Reaver must be careful. Ashley 
Ashley continues his search for the missing giant otter orphan Reva on Guyana's Rupununi River. Suddenly he sees a crowd of black vultures devouring something on the bank. can grow to six meters and will readily attack giant otters. If Reva was slow in the water, he could easily have been injured or killed. As the vultures scatter, Ashley spots a pile of fish remains. Caimans often snack on piranhas and catfish, but like vultures, they'll never turn down the chance to polish off any scraps and remains. The caiman has satisfied its hunger, but Ashley still needs to eat. It doesn't take him long to land a decent catch, a piranha. In the water, piranhas usually only attack injured animals, so even if he fell in, Ashley would be safe. But he still handles the piranha with care. It could bite his finger right off, and its teeth are so sharp that locals use them as tools and weapons. He needs to give himself enough time to set up camp, because the sun sets quickly on the equator and it will soon be pitch black. Ashley has camped on these beaches many times since he was a boy, and so he knows exactly what to do. His priority is a comfortable bed. The river creates a perfect breeding ground for mosquitoes. They emerge at dusk when the temperature falls. Ashley needs to make sure that his net touches the ground, or he won't sleep a wink. Next, somewhere to cook and something to eat. And finally, the comforts of modern technology. Tomorrow, he will resume his search for Reva. Back at the farm, Diane is delighted with the progress Sappho and Sergei have made since their arrival. She checks their droppings for signs of illness, such as diarrhea. Giant otters are very vulnerable to canine and feline distemper, and some viruses can kill them rapidly. She has already lost a few orphans to disease. Sergei and Sappho are both in superb condition. If they live to adulthood, they could grow to more than one and a half meters long. And Sergei, the male, could weigh up to 32 kilos. He swims with graceful ease, thanks to large, highly webbed feet and a powerful paddle-shaped tail. But he also uses his tail in another way, beating it to stop Sappho from scrounging his catch. It's a typical giant otter defense gesture. Then suddenly, Sappho surfaces with her first ever live fish. And to Diane's delight, she proceeds to eat it the right way round, just like a wild youngster. This is an important milestone. If the orphans decide to leave the farm, at least they will know how to eat properly. 
Diane may not even have the chance to say goodbye. Some orphans just swim off and stop responding to her calls. Others hang around for longer, gradually spending more and more time away from the farm. Until then, she must help them develop all the skills they need to live in the river, like diving. In the wild, the otters launch themselves in from rocks. Diane improvises with her own shoulder. Ashley, meanwhile, has finally reached one of the most remote lagoons. He scours every corner for telltale movements. Then something catches his eye. It's time to make a call. Oh, hey, good news. So, right, you're camping now? When I'll go and check them out, over. All right, um, let me meet at by the high sound bank, by the first high sound bank, over. Diane drops everything to catch up with Ashley. He has seen some giant otters, including one that looked familiar. But only Diane will know for sure whether it's Reva. Ashley leads Diane to the best vantage point and shows her where the giant otters were swimming. But the lagoon is glassy quiet again. For once, the birds can't distract Diane. Suddenly, they appear. Wild giant otters cruising straight towards them. Diane examines each little face for the familiar features she knows and loves. And there he is. He looks older, but that's Reva. There's no doubt about it. The wild otters have accepted him as their alpha male. Reva has a new family, but he hasn't forgotten his old foster mother. Reva the orphan has been adopted a second time. It means that he'll probably breed himself. For Diane, Reva is living proof that the work of her Otter Trust is truly worthwhile. Not just for individual orphans, but also for the whole species. This is the only reward she wants for all her hard work. Proof that one more little orphan has successfully settled back into the wild, helping to boost the world's population of these endangered creatures. Proof that Reva the orphan made it.